Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today um, on our workshop on scholarly identity. Uh, we're thrilled you could be here with us. Um, so this workshop, it's part of our programming, which is brought to you by the AERA Studying and Self-Regulated Learning SIGS Student Graduate Committee. Uh, it's headed by Dr. Abe Flanagan, and I'll be hosting today. My name is Stephanie Greenquist Marlett. My co-hosts are Sasha Lee and Lin Yu Yu. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. We have an amazing group of panelists. Um, I'm going to introduce each one of them quickly, uh, and then we'll give each panelist an opportunity to talk a little bit about their own scholarly identities. So it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Linda Bowl from Old Dominion University, Dr. Shelby Kuhlman from University of Memphis, Dr. Jill Glennon from Auburn University, Dr. Matt Bernacki from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and finally, Dr. Carlton Fong from Texas State University. Thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, so uh, before we hear from our panelists, uh, we just wanted to hear from our audience, uh, kind of gauge your knowledge on our discussion topic. So if you do me a favor, go ahead uh, into the Zoom chat, just type in a few words describing what scholarly identity means to you. Whatever comes to mind when you think of it, um, just go ahead and, and throw that in the chat for me now, if you don't mind. That's a great answer. Somebody mentioned um, what you want to be known Michael. for. Uh, what research you do, your research interests, absolutely. Um, your visible values and priorities, for sure. Uh, how your experiences impact your work, absolutely. The way you present yourself in the community, I love that. I'm seeing a lot about research, your research interests and goals, what you're passionate about, your contributions to that research. That's right on. Who you are, um, what your purpose is in your scholarly research, how your experiences and interests guide um, your scholarship. Absolutely. Your cohesive brand. I like that. This is great. I'm um, using your personal identities as strengths within your work. Your color expertise background as a scholar. Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, how you present yourself to your scholarly community. Those are all right answers. Absolutely right on. Um, thank you for participating. Um, so now um, we're going to go ahead. Um, and as you can see, there's a... a a wide diversity Diverse. of people. Oh, sorry, my mic is a little off right now. Um, but before we hear from our panelists, we just wanted to um, kind of um, gauge where you're at. So, so we appreciate your um, your feedback on that. Uh, but now we're gonna go back to our panelists one at a time. Just have them uh, share a little bit about their scholarly identity and speak to the importance um, of having a scholarly identity. Um, so Linda, would you uh, go ahead and start us off? Just tell us about your specific scholarly identity and then just share why you feel it's important to have one. So like almost everyone on the panel, right, I identify as an educational psychologist with a specialization in um, self-regulated learning and metacognition, right? So um, it's not going to be that different. I'm glad I got to go first. Um, so in terms of self-regulated learning, I've always tried to take a very applied approach. So that's part of my identity is, is taking some of this these theoretical concepts and then actually applying them to, to educational contexts. Um, in terms of metacognition, I've specialized, I think of myself as a calibration researcher as well. And so I've done a lot of work with calibration. And I think everyone here is familiar with calibration, but if it's not, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's metacognitive judgments about how well you think you're going to do on a task. Um, and then maybe after that task, how well you think you did. So I've done um, variations in that. And so that, that that's part of my identity. I think my secondary identity is as a program evaluator. I've done a lot of that work as well. Some of it's related to SRL and metacognition, some of it not so much, but my emphasis there has been to do, um, to do program evaluations in Title I schools, usually K-12, um, serving the, the, um, the needs and trying to support students who, who need it most. Uh, and then um, a part, another part of my um, identity is uh, 
related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I've been trying to be more um, explicit about those as I do my work before, you know, as it's become, you know, much more current and um, I think worthy um, in, in terms of it's, it's garnered a lot more attention. So, um, and I try to blend my scholarship with my teaching and service and I'm, you know, I have mixed success in that area. I think it's important, of course, because to have a coherent line of research um, is, is critical. So you become known for your area of specialization and hopefully people will cite you, right? And, and uh, invite you like to this panel. Thank you so much for having me here. And so that's important networking with colleagues, of course, and opening doors, providing um, opportunities for advancement, recruiting, mentoring students. So people might wanna come work with me, like Stephanie um, is one of my doctoral students. She wanted to come to Old Dominion and work with me. So um, because of my scholarly identity and hers merged with mine, it was a, a very good fit. Um, and then it, you know, and then it opens the doors to different kinds of professional service, um, um, all that fun stuff like editorial boards. And the SIG, of course, is is a really good, um, I think, instance of of how you know my our identities as SRL researchers get reinforced. Great, thank you so much, um, Shelby. Do you want to tell us about your scholarly identity and why it's important? Yeah, so um, I might take a little different of an approach. So I think as far as when I think about my scholarly identity, I actually just think first about my identity. So the good news when we're thinking about our scholarly identity is we had an identity before scholars. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're interested in thinking about how you build your scholarly identity, um, the good news is that you have a really nice place to start with, this, which is with who you were before you were a scholar. Um, so I think that's a really important place to start. Um, so that's kind of, and that really has motivated who I was, you know, before I was a scholar, before I attended graduate school, has continued to motivate my research uh, and my research narrative and, uh, you know, the collaborations and the work and the different things that I pursue um, are, are very reliant on the things that were really important to me, you know, well before I was a scholar. So I think some things that initially kind of motivated me and motivated my interests um, to eventually become an educational psychologist um, pretty early on. At first, I was a preschool teacher and um, I loved a lot of the things I did, and I also really didn't love a lot of the things I did. So I loved working with kiddos, um, and I loved education. I loved seeing them learn, but I didn't necessarily love doing it um, as the from the capacity of actually being a teacher. And those were things that really kind of motivated my initial interests. And a lot of the things that I saw that were really important in making having some type of effect on students and teachers we're doing things like being really engaged in my community, building strong relationships. And so those I think were big things that were, that have always been kind of a big part of my identity, something that I feel I have a lot of strengths in and something that motivated me to pursue a PhD in educational psychology. Then of course, when you enter into the academy, sometimes those things like community engagement and relationship building, are not necessarily the things that are prioritized first and forefront, especially when you're a student, right? The first thing is getting your research narrative going and um, getting some research done, getting papers out. Um, it's really easy to kind of become a part of that kind of research world and forget maybe a little bit of what initial and what initially motivated you to be there. Um, so I think something that was really important to me was that I, um, sorry, my Zoom is, people are moving in my Zoom and I keep thinking that maybe I'm dropping out or not. Uh, so I'm glad I'm still here. That's why I keep pausing. I'm like, oh no, what's happening? Um, so anyway, so just over time, I think what was important to me was that I continued to remember that as I developed my scholarly identity, that that continued to be tied back into my identity well before I was a scholar. Um, and those things were reiterated and important and grounded and foundational in my work. Um, things like community engagement and, and building relationships. And so over time, you know, that those were the big things I think that 
really actually ended up developing my research and then helped me to establish this strong research narrative. And I think that goes into kind of the second component of the question, which is just why it's important to have a scholarly identity. And I think that's because having a strong scholarly identity that's probably grounded in a strong identity just for yourself helps you to ensure that you operate and, and function within academic spaces in a way that's well aligned to your values. So I think that that's probably a key part of having a strong academic identity and making sure that identity is, is grounded within your core values tied to your core identity. So yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think um, it's really important to stay true to your identity first and foremost, and that your scholarly identity will often be informed by that. Um, and also as a fellow preschool teacher, I can definitely relate how that just informs, you know, your experiences inform your research beyond that. So thank you so much. Um, all right, uh, if we could hear from you, Jill, about your scholarly identity and uh, why it's important to have one. Of course. Um... So I guess I think of my scholarly identity, certainly self-regulated learning is at the core. And I guess I view it kind of like a bullseye or a target. And so I originally started looking at college students' self-regulated learning. And then I got obviously more into the motivational part, which is certainly an important um, component of self-regulated learning, right? And then I kind of brought in that and looked at uh, parental and peer influences on self-regulated learning, but specifically motivation, self-regulated learning, cognition, cognitive strategies, metacognition, ultimately academic outcomes. And some of you have heard this story, and I know Diane was a part of this research project, still is. Um, we submitted this, what we thought was an awesome IRB on March 6th of 2020, just ready to collect this data on parental and peer influences on college students. And of course, we did not foresee the global pandemic coming to this degree. And we got IRB approval and we realized that we had no more college students. They were all home. So I had a few moments of depression, but then I reframed it and I said to myself, wait a minute, there's never been a better time to study parental influences. Our students are all home with their parents. And then of course, thank goodness, they came back on campus eventually. So we had comparisons between parental influences and peer influences. So we looked at all of this in the context of the COVID-19 global pandemic. And more recently, um, kind of our next steps are to look at college students with maybe more neurodivergent college students. And we wanna look at students with ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, autism spectrum, et cetera. Um, so just, I feel like it started out as self-regulated learning and then it certainly has evolved, I think over the years. And I guess in terms of why I think it's important to have a scholarly identity, I just feel like it's good to have a solid research identity and research agenda. Um, you know, I think we all work with people who are a little bit all over the place and there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe they're just genius on different levels, but I, I just feel like self-regulated learning has always been at the heart or the core of my research agenda. And I feel like that's kept me really grounded. Great, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Matt, uh, could you please share about your scholarly identity? Sure. So I think mine's maybe maybe approaching Shelby's, but with a little bit different lens to it, where I I identify a number of different ways based on my formation um, that kind of began in educational psychology and then was augmented through like a learning sciences and technology lens. And I kind of take a person by task, person by environment kind of approach. And it's an emergent identity based on the room I'm in and the shape of how my research and identity fits the conversation. Um, so I will often find myself code switching or changing out the ways that I describe my identity and switching figure and ground based upon the kind of conversation I need to contribute to. Um, and I think that that's probably an important thing to say out loud because it's a developmental process and that wasn't always true. So like I, I would have been more canonically an EdSec person for a while than I was temporarily moonlighting as a you know person who plays a learning scientist while I figured out what that was and ultimately settle into one of those Venn diagram-y kind of things that you see in job talks and colloquia and whatnot. So I think it's it's probably really important for us to think about all of this as an ongoing ipsative shaping identity um, and as one that can be reshaped depending upon 
what the focal task is right now, who we're with, and how we need to either uh, corroborate or complement somebody. Great, thank you. Um, and last but not least, Carlton, can you tell us about your scholarly identity and why it's important to have one? It's hard to go last after all those great answers, but uh, I'll try to, I'll try to do my spiel. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say um, part of my scholarly identity involves research interests. I think those change, um, but broadly it's motivation and self-regulated learning in college settings. Um, thinking about the factors that relate to those processes like feedback and social dynamics like help seeking and belonging. Um, but I think beyond research interests, um, a lot of my identity, I think, is guided by values and kind of kind of pervasive goals that I have. I think goals like understanding evidence, heterogeneity and evidence, things like synthesis of research, um, things like social, cultural and critical perspectives. How can we understand the social and cultural contexts and how these uh, dynamics may actually inform our understanding of learning? And so um, so I, I would say a larger part of my identity are these values and goals that um, that guide my work. And thus, it's important to have those because I think as your research interests may evolve, it's all kind of undergirded by those values. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the themes that I heard that that really resonates with me is just how it's um, okay and even important to kind of change and adapt your scholarly identity. Um, and maybe you have, you know, like Jill has the groundwork in SRL and you kind of grow from there as you expand into different directions. Um, thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Um, so now um, we received some questions um, from the survey that we sent out prior to this workshop. Thank you, uh, audience members, for those. Uh, we took those, we developed some questions based off your interests, what you wanted to know more about. Um, so for our panelists, I'm going to open up the discussion to all of you. Feel free to jump in when you have something you want to share. Uh, and the first question is, how did you develop your scholarly identity throughout your academic career? I guess that's actually kind of a, what I tried to answer the first time. But um, if I were to elaborate on that thematically a little bit, I kind of stuck with the like, well, what communities do I identify with on the first go round? But like, it's it's always been more project based, where it's kind of emergent through that initial relationship with an advisor and uh, and the projects to which you can contribute and start to build some kind of evidence to yourself as you self-explain and feel out whether or not you believe yourself about your own identity, uh, which I think probably is still more of an ongoing uh, challenge for all of us, even if it doesn't come off that way. Um, but yeah, over time, like the shape of one's identity builds based on the volume of time spent on all those different topics. So I was very much a self-regulated learning only person until I had to figure out how to do a dissertation that was sufficiently novel to get my committee to approve it. And that drove the, the push to technology. Um, and then in a postdoctoral space, I had to broaden and kind of re-envision myself as I moved into kind of learning sciences conversation uh, and also stand as an authority, quote unquote, as the metacognition and motivation person, as like a postdoc hired to bring motivation to a cognitive science and computer science community, uh, which was challenging, but really empowering at the same time, because I really had to do the work to be sufficiently representative of a gigantic community that wasn't yet uh, present in that space. Uh, and I'd be curious how other folks have kind of seen that shape emerge for them as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'll just add on to that, uh, that I think part of developing a scholarly identity, at least for myself, was I think just being open to the different experiences and contexts that were before me. Um, so I was in a ed psych PhD program, but my postdoc was actually in a higher ed leadership and policy program. And I think um, that was really eye-opening. You know, I wasn't really attuned to um, the various, you know, contextual, structural factors involved in student learning and development. I think it was more kind of narrowly focused on kind of the micro context of learning. 
And I think broadening out to seeing systems and structures, I was just kind of like, whoa, like I felt learning was already complex just, you know, at the task level or at the classroom level, but goodness, there's all of these other, you know, forces at play. And um, so that, like, I think at the moment I could have been like, no, I'm just going to stick with what I've been taught and the ways I've done my dissertation and just kind of stick with that. Or I could be open to that experience and open to different mentors and different experiences there and say, no, how can I, you know, marry these two? How can I kind of embrace this quote unquote tension, right? And actually um, think of, you know, new research or different flavors of that research that could emerge from there. And so, um, so I don't think it was like a strategic, like this is the identity I wanted to have and I'm going to get there. I think it was kind of just being open to these new experiences that, you know, I've happened to have collected over those times and having, you know, a pretty high degree of openness to be able to embrace those experiences to really inform what I study. Yeah, thank you. So I, I just wanted to mention, and, and I, I agree with, with what Carlton and Matt were saying, they're really, really good points, but part of it is um, it's sort of shaped by collaborative, you know, relationships as well, like with your, either with your mentors and then the people who might be on a big grant project that you're working with. And so you kind of find a way to, to meld your own identity with, you know, the work that other people are doing so that it becomes, you know, um, almost kind of a social learning experience in some ways, right? And so, um, and then, and so it wasn't just, oh, I'm going to be this, right? Which is a theme I've heard um, from some of you too, is, is kind of what are the opportunities that are presented to me and how can I work with and network with my colleagues and, and have this agenda that's um, more collaborative? <clears throat> Sorry, I think just to build on that, I think, all, my experience has been largely similar, but maybe like a little bit um, just for student, like graduate students from an earlier career perspective. I mean, something that I think may like happened a lot for me that's maybe comforting for, for all the graduate students on the call is I think you're, you know, if you're really concerned about having a really strong scholarly identity as a, a PhD student, um, that's great to work on. And I certainly hope you are, but I think it's at least for me, you know, I think that was something that was really guided by my advisor in graduate school. So just to be kind of, you know, I think Matt and Carlton have mentioned that, but to be a little bit more specific, you know, that was, I was receiving a lot of guidance. And so who I kind of thought I was, or maybe who I should be was pro is probably a better terms, you know, that was really guided by mentorship during grad school, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? You're learning a lot. Um, and sometimes I think it, learning those things and establishing a research narrative and establishing a, this really strong scholarly identity, that's a lot to take on at one time. So it's okay to kind of subsume uh, maybe others identity a little bit. But during that time, you can really think about like what parts of these identities that I'm being mentored by, what which of those align to my values, which of those don't. And then you can think about after graduate school, which of these things sustain uh, and which of these things kind of drop out, right, which is totally OK. So then so while, you know, in graduate school, I feel like my identity was, you know, very largely paralleled my advisor. After grad school, things started to change. I want to do something a little different. So then I worked more in self-regulated learning. I worked in a learning sciences program. Um, you know, I had two postdoc advisors, one being Matt on the call, and uh, another being Jeff Green. And and they had lot. They had identities as well, right? And as a postdoc, it's really nice because you kind of have these postdoc advisors, but you have the PhD now, so you don't have to always listen to them. S secret secret advice here. Uh, you don't always have to listen to them, right? You're like, I have a PhD now, so I don't always have to take your advice. So, so they give you advice, and Matt and Jeff give great advice, but I didn't always take it, right? You get to decide now during a postdoc, like, which of these things am I really going to kind of pick to to that aligns with my values or what's something that it that belongs to someone else? And I'm going to let that, you know, be their thing and I'm going to 
let that, you know, them stay in their lane and I'm going to do my own thing. So I think over time, it is really this kind of opportunity to craft what makes sense to you. And that's why just going back, I think having a strong identity to begin with and knowing what's important to you and what your values are is really important because as you start to craft your scholarly identity, it'll be easier to pick and choose. This aligns with my values. This aligns with my research interests. This doesn't. Um, so yeah. I think that's, I think. I can validate that for a moment. So, you know, the hiring of a postdoc, sometimes you need to hire a postdoc with a sufficiently coherent and emergent identity and with enough of a sense of self that you can know that they're complementary to you in the way that Linda's describing. Um, and through that kind of team science approach, like there are times where we have advice within our lane that Shelby maybe should or shouldn't follow as she's trying to figure out when to you know, assimilate, accommodate, or diverge productively for her or for a project uh, in general, as she was, you know, brought in to bring different skill sets and perspectives as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting because um, as a graduate student, we're definitely um, influenced uh, by our mentors and the experts around us. And then at some point, we want to take what's salient and meaningful and kind of, you know, form our own identities. Um, I guess I have a question for all of you um, from a graduate student uh, perspective. Um, have you, has your identity ever changed, um, your scholarly identity based off of the influence of one of your mentees? I would say 100%. I think that's actually the fun part of being a faculty mentor. That's what I tell my students. And that's what I tell other people outside of academia that like my favorite part is getting to work with students and starting with maybe the core of my scholarly identity, but kind of seeing it branch out and seeing it marry with my students' interests has been the best part of uh, being an academic. And they bring so much knowledge and experience and perspective um, that I know little of. And getting to be able to take those and um, be able to um, do some really interdisciplinary work has been really neat. Um, so for instance, I have a lot of students that bring their cultural identity. So whether it's an indigenous identity, a Latinx identity, they're able to bring them, bring themselves and then bring the constructs and frameworks and, and theories that they're interested in. And so I've never encountered community cultural wealth until like five or six years ago, but a lot of my students are interested in that framework. And so we were able to integrate some of that work into some of the frameworks that I knew and be able to create something new from that. So I would say um, not only has my research interest been shaped, but I think over time that's shaped my identity too, because now I'm like, well, I see the importance of having like an asset-based wealth perspective. Um, so so that, that's just one small example, but I think that's happened multiple times a year and it's been really cool to to be able to experience that cool thank you uh all right thank you going on to the next question uh how have your research interests evolved over time and how did they influence your scholarly identity I'll go first. I feel like I haven't gotten to talk about the research as much. So I'm, this, this is a good question to do it. So I think, you know, a big thing for me, so I did my PhD with Logan Fiorello and our work was primarily in multimedia learning, um, focused around the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Um, in that I still very much work in the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. That's maybe my home theory, if you can have one of those. Uh, that's my home base, probably. Uh, so that was where a lot of my work started, but because of kind of this identity I had already been shaping that fed into that, a big question I had as we were doing that work was like, you know, I feel like we're kind of missing some important things here. You know, this is a great theory. It's 
fairly robust. There's a lot of research on it. It's really important, but we're missing some things. Like what if a student's never even motivated to start learning in a technology-based environment to begin with? Like what if they just turn off the computer and they're, they say bye and leave? You know, I felt like we were missing some important things. And then it wasn't just how do they get motivated to do it in the first place, but how do they sustain that motivation? How do they, you know, regulate their engagement? Uh, I had lots of questions that it seemed like their research on multimedia learning hadn't addressed so much, or maybe had addressed from more of a, a kind of surface level. So that was kind of what, so I started to ask those questions questions felt like we were missing something and that's ultimately what motivated me to do a postdoc and something that was slightly different from my PhD work which was more in self-regulated learning but we were looking at learning from technology um, so there were lots of good rich multimedia environments for me to continue studying in um, I also got to learn a new methodology which I think that is really important we haven't talked so much about uh, kind of methods and how that works into your narrative. Um, but being strong in, in, in a method or a couple of methods is really important, um, particularly for going up on the job market. Um, so I got to learn more about learning analytics and, and how to do that type of work. And that actually made me, I mean, that really uniquely set me up for my current position here at the University of Memphis, where I work in a research institute where everyone studies learning with technology and lots of folks do it with things like machine learning and artificial intelligence methods, big data, learning analytics, all those things. But something that I have that's a bit unique to the research institute is I did start to branch out and study these, these things like the role of motivation in technology-based environments or how students self-regulate their learning in technology-based environments. And lots of the faculty in the Institute, when I had my job talk and stuff, you know, they really resonated with the talk. They were like, I think about that stuff all the time. That's so important. I'm so glad you're looking at it. But most of these folks have very traditional cognitive psychology training. So it's not so much their wheelhouse. So many of them were really excited once I started to work here that, I have more of the experience in SRL and motivation. So that kind of initial training in graduate school is still very much what I do today, but then all of the additional kind of nuance that I got to receive in my postdoc is what kind of made me actually particularly competitive or kind of interesting um, to the folks at Memphis and why I'm in my position now. So I think we've talked a little bit about, you know, being open to, to new things, to learning new things. When I started working at UNC in my postdoc, it definitely was um, challenging at first. I've never, you know, opened up an Excel spreadsheet that takes an hour and a half to open because there's, you know, a million plus cells of data on it. So, you know, like those things are very new when before I was working in, you know, predominantly lab research, experimental designs, you know, 60 participants, a little bit of data. So there were lots of new things and that was not a super comfortable space for me, but it was so great and it paid off in the end. So yeah, being willing to try new things and being open to your identity changing over time. Thank you. So I began um, my master's program. I was much more of a behaviorist and my master's um, thesis was vicarious reinforcement. Then I get to Berkeley study in Tolman Hall, which is all about cognition. And so I knew I had to really, you know, um, change my my tact a bit. And so I kind of made, you know, this this um this bridge between some of the work that I had done earlier and started to think about, okay, well, what kinds of course characteristics might prompt good study strategies? And that's why our SIG is actually about studying because initially it was gonna be studying and then Zimmerman came in and made it studying and self-regulated learning. And then I got exposed to a lot of the self-regulated learning um, research and colleagues who studied self-regulated learning. So then I changed again, right, to, to, to focusing more on that. And then um, I was at the University of Memphis too, Shelby, and that's where I started working on calibration research too. So um, it's it's really changed a lot. And, and one of the reasons it's changed par partly is because I had to, right, because that was the work that I, that was the kind of work that um, people were doing that 
um, were mentoring me initially. And then um, I was able to find my own identity, I think a little, a little more soundly. Great, thank you so much. Um, moving on to the next question, and we touched about this uh, a little bit already, but if you have anything you want to expand upon, um, how did mentorship, so either as a mentor or a mentee, uh, play a role in shaping your scholarly identity? I think it's a good prompt to kind of reassess what you what you believe about what you study and have to explain it to someone else and it helps you kind of refine your own assumptions and make them more nuanced uh, so in many ways like when i think through like my work on developing interventions to support self-regulated learning um, it sounds like a good idea in principle to do that and it's a big and open-ended space to try to approach um, but to have to make hard decisions and do so in conversation with people who have other ideas was really powerful and doing that with with students who kind of bring different perspectives are thinking about different students and can bring in different like you know our developmental models versus something that is more kind of parsing out the cognitive metacognitive processes like there's lots of ways to cut it up um and the the kind of the praxis of it all when you're with students forces everything to be more transparent and sounder um so i think that uh ha really has a a nice a nice effect because it makes everything a bit more uh, discreet and explicit and you can evaluate it and improve it over time and test your ideas together. Great. Well, thank you all uh, for those answers. We're actually going to take a brief pause in our discussion. We want to hear from our audience uh, for a little while. So uh, what we're going to do, audience, is we're going to put a link um, to a mentee discussion board in the chat. Uh, we have a prompt for everybody to answer. Um, and what we want to know is just what's one idea that's really resonated with you so far in this workshop? So if you can do me a favor, go to that link in the chat. It's going to take you to mentee. Um, there's a box on the right of the screen. You can type in um, a short response and then everybody's answers are going to pop up on the screen. Uh, so again, we'd love to hear just something that's resonated with you so far. And if anybody is brave enough to come on the mic and share, uh, please feel free. You're welcome to do so. All right, we have some great answers coming in so far, um, allowing your projects, your research to craft your identity, um, acknowledging that everybody's experience is different. It's okay if your identity changes and grows over time, absolutely. Yes, I agree uh, with a comment about Carlton, um, sharing that his interests sometimes change according to his students, love that. being open to experiences that will shape your identity in ways you cannot foresee, 100%. Asking yourself uh, which communities you identify with, uh, that's excellent. Um, and that can help shape your work and identity for sure. Postdoc positions as part of that trajectory. Shelby's insight on connecting core values to one's identity, I agree. Great, great responses. Thank you. Uh, did anybody want to come off the mic and uh, share with everybody? Please feel free to do so if you if you want to. Call it a few more as they come in. Let's see. Identity is fluid, adaptable, depending on context. Yep. Expanding your research interests um, to get a more novel research is a great way to expand your identity. 
This is great. I'm also seeing some really great questions here and also in the chat. We will have a question and answer at the end. So save them for those. We will definitely get to as many as um, time will uh, allow for us. There are some uh, discussions about primary and secondary identities in the chat. Um, there are two questions. So one is how do you balance those uh, when you have more than one research interest and areas of expertise? And then there is a follow-up question on that. Um, how do you balance when your research takes you across areas? Uh, for example, studying motivation from either social or educational psychology, how do you articulate your identity when more than one identifier could be applicable? Panelists, if you have any uh, thoughts or responses on those, we'd love to hear from you. There's one comment that just popped up that uh, is about like a coherent identity. And I feel like that is, that's the the dream when we think about like, well, what are these different emergent directions and are they converging, diverging? And there's, there's a little bit of a storytelling that needs to happen to kind of bring those um, trajectories of your identity together or to allow them to vary if we're thinking about like, you know, growth curve type thinking. Um, and like when it is so project driven, there are serendipitous events that a lot of us have referenced that kind of lead to growth in one and not the other for a while. And sometimes like something just stops growing entirely. Like if a field moves away from an area that you were studying, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Um, so the idea of having at least, you know, a little bit of ingenuity about finding the thread that you can sustain as some things go by the wayside, as you can evolve as say technologies evolve or the, the shape of the learning environment that students occupy evolves like all that's really important um for me i guess i i sometimes struggle to balance the when am i studying personalized learning when am i studying self-regulated learning because most people kind of treat all that under one umbrella even though i think of them as entirely distinct and i've had to actually come around to appreciating that like it is an intersecting conversation and that those lines can and should converge eventually um and I need to embrace that there could be a coherence down the way, even if those are entirely different pursuits in terms of current scopes of work for me right now. Um, but they should eventually feed towards how do we actually you know, support the learner and do so in more dynamic ways than maybe the technology and our intervention approaches allow for us to do right now. Um, so some of it, I think, is like maintaining a high enough level narrative for yourself so that you can understand the coherence and kind of craft it in a way that you can help others see why you're doing what you're doing um, or convince you that you shouldn't be if they don't buy it. Yeah, I I really like that answer. And I also think about the question about primary and secondary identity, I guess, like for me, I guess one concrete example is my primary identity, I guess would be motivation researcher and then my secondary identity would be like meta analyst systematic reviewer and so let's just take those for example um if there's a project that's on a meta-analysis on sorry shall be like cognitive strategies let's say i would probably be like yes that fits my secondary identity like it's a meta analysis and if Shelby asked me I probably would work on it with her but <laughs> I think what helps is that I can use my primary identity to kind of draw a line and say you know what I do focus on meta-analysis but really my primary identity is really on motivation so I probably should be doing like a meta-analysis on something about motivation so and not cognitive strategies so so that's kind of how I balance things like it allows me to like say no to things, which I think is a whole nother webinar. <laughs> but I think I'm learning that to help me say no to things, I need to look at my primary identity and say, you know what, is this going to, and like borrowing from like a Marie Kondo, like, is this going to spark joy, right? And I think it often sparks joy when it's core to my primary identity despite having these secondary identities 
it kind of has to typically flow from the primary one first. So I'm not sure if that was helpful at all, but um, that's kind of how my crazy mind works sometimes, so. Yeah, I might elaborate on that if it's okay. Um, yeah. And I know Diane, some of my students have heard this story before, and I think some of you are graduate students. Start, starting as a graduate student, I think it's really important to find your passion and to be true to yourself. And I think it's really easy to jump on an assistantship or get engaged in your professor's research, and there's nothing wrong with that. But um, I tell this story, I had a student and she was rehashing and rehashing and rehashing a review of the literature. And it was on a particular motivation theory. And I finally sat her down and I looked at her. I said, you, you really don't love this. And she was like, I mean, what do you mean? And I said, I just don't think you love this research. And she started to cry and I didn't mean to make her cry, but she said, there's no way I can start over. I've put too much into this. I've come too far. And I said, I, I'm not suggesting you start over, but I think we need an honest conversation. I mean, she truly had no passion for this topic. And I said, what is it that you do when you know and love every single day? And she actually had a full-time job in um, cooperative extension and nutrition education, seemingly very unrelated. And I said, well, tell me about what you do every day. And just the passion was overflowing. And I was like, you like motivation, but how can we link that to what you're passionate about? And to be honest, she ended up writing a dissertation on learning and motivation and nutrition education with second graders. Frankly, it's a topic I knew absolutely nothing about, but she did a really nice job of intersecting it with cognition, motivation, self-regulated learning. To date, it is the most published publication that I have ever been on. It, it just blossomed in her field. And she is now, 20 years later, she's an absolute expert in this area. So I try to tell my doctoral students, I want, you're going to be married to this dissertation. I hate to use that analogy, but you need to find something that you love and that you are passionate about. And if you can do that, this can sustain you for the next 20, 25 years in your profession. And that was self-regulated learning for me. I found that in 1991, and I'm still to some degree doing research on self-regulated learning. So I think in terms of identity, there's a lot to be said for being true to yourself and what you really want to do. And it kind of, I think, elaborates a little bit on what Carlton said as well, you know, saying no and being true to yourself. Yeah, thank you. Oh, so I much. think that, um, oh, I'm sorry. What, what Car I, Carlton having two identities, I, I have the same thing. I think I mentioned that I also do program evaluation work. And sometimes it's not related to SRL, but it's just my, you know, it's just, I feel like I'm giving back, right? It's, it's my sort of, I feel like it's a way that I can contribute, you know, to helping programs be more successful. And I've gotten some flack for that, right? It's like, okay, you're, you know, it's not very coherent. This research agenda is kind of veering off here and you just have to make a case for, you know, maybe you've got these two areas, right? And um, making a case for why each is important. And, and I refuse to give up on the one, you know, the program evaluation stuff in, in, um, in these schools that, that needed support, you know, because I, I did have the methodological skills to, to help. And so I felt, it, it just felt good, you know, it was like, almost like, it didn't get paid very well. It felt like volunteer work sometimes, but it's what I liked. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's where the values come into play, right? Doing what's important, doing what's fulfilling uh, the service community aspect of your scholarly identity is really important too. Uh, thank you for all for sharing. Um, okay, we're gonna go on to the next question. Uh, what advice would you give a graduate student or early career scholar on seeking mentors to align with their emerging scholarly identities? I think one of the things that you can do is talk to um, that the person, the mentors, other students, you know, just have a conversation about what it was like to work with those people. Did they offer you opportunities to 
present at conferences with them? Did they offer you opportunities to maybe publish or work on a grant together? Do they have the time, right? They might be a really good fit, but they've already got this like, you know, this big slate of other students and they, they may not be able to devote the, the time that you would like. So those, those are just a couple of the things to, to look out for. Um, when you go on the job market, you want someone with a really good, with a good reputation so that when they write you these letters of recommendation that you're recognizable and, um, and that will help you, I think, um, secure, um, a, a, you know, the, the, the position that you may want. Not unlike the, is this a topic that really compels you and you, you're passionate about, I think kind of the praxis of working with an advisor is really important. So in addition to kind of all the cognitive stuff that Linda's talking about, the effective stuff really matters too, right? So like you need to find an advisor and like that, that person is somebody you really want to talk to and enjoy talking with, because if you don't, it's brutal for years of your life and that's not cool. So like you, you definitely want to have somebody who helps you think you like to think with them um, and values your opinion enough that you help them think too. Like if it's not that kind of dyadic exchange, then I don't know. It's a weird model. I would also add just expanding the social learning model <laughs> that I think we've been mostly focused on to, I think, broaden and also think about kind of like a social cultural learning and that text is also part of um our learning experience. And so uh, human mentoring, amazing. I'm not knocking that at all, but I'm also going to give advice that centers around reading, <laughs> reading and engaging the literature and the scholarship. And I think that was my first mentor and continues to mentor me as I read in my discipline, read outside of my discipline. Um, and I think that not only helps me find the human mentors because I'm able to engage with them at kind of the same um, a background knowledge as I read, but it also informs a lot about how I think and how I do research and how I think about education. And so um, I would also say human mentoring, yes, and the literature and the scholarship, because I think that's where you're going to start and that's going to continually feed you um and so i would say don't forget that too i i think to add on to both of those things don't think of mentorship as something that comes from one person of course you have a primary mentor or advisor but I feel like as a grad student, I really had a it takes a village approach. And there were lots of faculty in my department who had very particular strengths. Some were very topical uh, methodological strengths. Some spoke to what Matt just said and had more affective strengths, um, which is as someone who likes to emote a lot, um, if you know me, uh, that's something that I really need. Um, so I need sometimes people who can do that as well. Um, so one thing about if you're a grad student, you might already have an advisor. So you might not be able to, you know, change so much at this point, but consider the fact that there are other opportunities. You can seek out other folks. Also, we have a fan, even outside of your department, I hope, I don't know, it's homecoming and the parade is going by my window. So I don't know how much everyone else can hear that. It might be really festive for everyone. Um, okay, that's going to be glad everyone can hear it. Uh, anyway, so, but we have a really great community of researchers and there are probably lots of SSRL researchers who have mentored me without me realizing, um, you know, going to talks, to symposia, to panels at AERA, um, and, you know, at APA and all of them, I have learned so much that I incorporate in my research and teaching every single day. Um, so there are lots of folks who are willing to even just grab a lunch with you during a conference or something like that. If you need very particular advice and you've heard them speak or you've seen them engage on social media in a way that feels very aligned um, to your interests, your values, to something that you need. So I really challenge everyone to not think of mentorship as something that has to come from one person, but something that can come from this whole fantastic community because there's lots of learning opportunities. And typically it's always been my experience that 
for the most part, everyone is very giving with their time um, in, in meeting with students and, and wanting to help them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Shelby. And to your point, um, and to Carlton's as well, um, I think it's really important to, you know, learn research outside of your, your, your discipline as well, making connections to other fields and bringing that into to what you're researching. And I think that helps establish your identity as well. So thank you for those points. All right, moving on to our next question. How important is community involvement, uh, such as professional organizations, conferences, that sort of thing, um, in developing and maintaining a scholarly identity? Super important. <laughs> yeah, I think we're probably it's unanimous probably with this panel. I think ARA is a great place. There's other related organizations as well. Um, I mean, going back to social identity theory, right? In the seventies, right? Your identity is gonna be shaped by your social environment, your relationships, your affiliations. And so um, I'm so glad to be part of ARA. I think that's really shaped. Um, how I think, how I act, how I learn, um, and how I continue to evolve in all those areas. Um, I love ARA. Not only can you go small and focus on your SIG and your interests, but you can hop around down the hall and go to a totally different area and you're all still focused on educational research and you just learn so much. And I love it. I'm I'm the poster child for ARAs. I love it. So, yeah, I'm with you. I think that's an excellent point. And we can't underestimate the power of the SIG because you can find, I always say, our SIG is my home away from home in AERA. You walk in and everyone understands what you're doing and knows what you're doing. And I feel like this SIG in particular is so welcoming. You can go in and talk to anyone, and they're all just so supportive, especially of graduate students and, um, and I think it's also really important for networking and, and um, having, you know, people, you can get opportunities, you know, as you get to know people, I've got, you know, friends in the SIG now, and sometimes they'll invite me to, you know, um, contribute a chapter or, you know, to be on a panel like this one, right? I mean, um, yeah, there's, there's, it's, um, and when it comes time for those external letters, right? Um and then, you know, people in the SIG that, that might, you know, be um, kind enough to, to write you a letter. So I went from the one getting the letters to now the one writing the letters, right? And, and, uh, and I know about their work because we, we do many of the same things. So that's, you know, the networking, the mentoring, as um, Shelby said, is so important. And I guess one more random point, but um, when I came to Auburn, I had a wonderful colleague. He has moved up so much. He's now a dean in a major university, but he gave me some really good advice my first year. And he said, align yourself with the field and the profession and you can never go wrong. And what he meant by that is it's so easy at our universities to get bogged down with departmental stuff and all the service and you know, even departmental drama, all the things. But I think that's been really good advice. If you can align yourself with maybe AERA and or APA as a whole, but then find a SIG or two where it's kind of a smaller family within the large AERA, for example, I think that was really good guiding advice. You know, just kind of align yourself with the profession. So you just constantly have that mentoring throughout your entire career. Yeah, I'll just amplify that and maybe speak to um, Travis made a great point in the chat just about, you know, dealing with feelings of loneliness and, and maybe feeling lost. I mean, just to echo that if other grad students are feeling that way. I when I started my PhD program, my identity definitely faltered a little. I mean, I really felt like maybe academia was not a space for me. It felt like this is, you know, I, I don't fit in in a way that I thought I would, you know, maybe this isn't where I belong. I really had a lot of kind of challenges with belongingness. And honestly, the biggest thing early on that 
change that was going to conferences like AERA, where I started to find lots of other folks who I was like, oh my gosh, wait, is that my person? Um, you know, and we got along in lots of ways. We had really good aligned research interests, but we had similar values and, um, and interests. And those things made me feel so much more like, wait, like there's a space in academia for me. Um, and not just for me to kind of fit into academic expectations and kind of fit into the current puzzle piece of academia, but actually to etch out my own space. So that way I can fit exactly as I am, not that I need to fit myself, uh, you know, into a long standing academic system. So I think it's super important for doing that, especially if you're not feeling it as much in your home department. Great. I think we heard a lot of really good Good advice to students. Thank you for that. Um, uh oh, I hope I'm not uh, freezing up on you here. I'm going to keep going. Thank you for the thumbs up. Um, all right. So we're going to take a moment now uh, hear from the audience once again. Sasha is going to put another mentee link in the chat. Uh, this time, uh, what we're curious about is um, what are some of the challenges that you anticipate uh, or maybe you've already encountered in developing your own scholarly identity? Um, so again, if you can just go ahead and click on that link, uh, add your response to the mentee board about any challenges you anticipate or you've encountered in developing your scholarly identity. Yes, Carlton, mentee does sound like mentee. <laughs> So some of the challenges, time, time's always a challenge to uh, explore um, your scholarly identity, knowing the right ways to describe your work, having more than one identity, sometimes they conflict. A uh, first year PhD student says that they're having a hard time narrowing down interests, for sure. Um, it's a little hard to focus on one thing. Other challenges are uh, creating a narrative because I have different research and methodology interests, narrowing down my topic, being selective about projects that come your way. I think that's a really important one too. Um, competing identities, roles, and interests, um, balancing interest with methodological expertise. That's a really interesting response. Intersectionality. Um, having your identity be too fragmented across multiple projects. I see some themes here. Creating a storyline based on scattered scholarship experiences. Uh, here's one from a second year PhD student uh, who says they don't have many publications, which has made them feel less confident in endorsing their identity as a researcher, um, focused on sense of belonging in girls in STEM. Uh, here's a question for the panel if anybody wants to answer. What uh, is, in your opinion, the max number of scholarly identities that you would recommend? <laughs> anybody want to tackle that one? <laughs> well, 20 feels like too many. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Two or three? I'm, and I don't know why. Why? where that comes from. That's a good question. Unless your identity is someone that has 20 identities. <laughs> then you only have one. Yeah, I, I do think Carlton, that actually helps a little bit where we're like, if we think about the granularity, like we could always keep going, right? Like when you start to parse all your intersections, that's how we get to be individually different. Uh, so if you can kind of think through like dimensions of affinity, whether those are, you know, conceptual, methodological, values driven, et cetera, all those are relevant. They don't all level up to capital I identity. They're all kind of ingredients in your identity. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really a matter of, well, how far do you zoom in and how do you find a productive lens to apply to your program of scholarly work 
um, and how you, how can you kind of change the resolution or change the perspective if you think like in a three mountains task kind of way, like who's the viewer and how do they need to appreciate you from that perspective is probably a better way to think about it where like there aren't really hard edges to like the identities you have. There's a, a narrative you craft given a context and an audience and that is your identity as you need to live it in that moment. Um, and that gives you lots of room for it to evolve project by project, relationship by relationship. Yeah, what I meant is, is that you don't want to have too, that you, too many disconnected identities, right? Especially early in your career. Um, later on, you might have the latitude to just kind of go, you know, um, go off a little bit more. But yeah, but making a case for maybe there are lots, like you said, uh, Matt, lots of different identities, but you have to make an argument for how they're connected, especially early on, I think. Yeah, I feel like it's important to clarify, at least in my definition, an, an identity is not a research interest. Like we can have, I mean, I think it's like, I think those things are right. My identity is not all of my research interests. My identity is actually my research narrative. So I have, so, you know, think about, you know, just to get basic again, if you're in an elevator and you have three minutes to tell someone what you do, what are you going to tell them in those three minutes? You like, so we have various research. Okay, less, 30 seconds. So what do you, it's good to, you, could, you should have a 30 second one, a three minute one, a five minute one, a 10 minute one. I'm just saying. Uh, so think about length of elevator. Is it, you know, 10 floors or a hundred or something? But anyway, I your research interests are to me not individual identities. Like my identity is not learning analytics. Um, although my brain sometimes feels like a giant Excel spreadsheet with millions of data points, um, that's not my identity. It's it's a research interest, but it feeds into a broader narrative that goes to my identity. So I think that's an important distinction. Right. I thought that we were talking about scholarly identity though. And that to me does suggest research, but you know, it's also, I guess it could also entail teaching service, you know, community professional stuff too, but yeah, um, I yeah think I've got I a lot of different like, identities that, that are have nothing to do with scholarship too. Yeah. I think more like just super specific interest. So like our, I think our scholarly identity is research, but it's not like my one very, very nuanced interest in like this thing, right? Like that small nuance feeds into a broader scope of work. So I feel like your broader scope is more your identity than like a super individual interest. If everyone asks, if you ask my interests, I might have 20 interests, but those are woven into a, a narrative, I guess is how I think about it. Thank you. And if you're not following the chat, there's some pretty interesting responses in there. Highly encourage everybody to, to check those out. Um, all right. Well, thank you all for the, uh, for the last part of our workshop. I just wanted to open the floor to our audience um, to do a question and answer session. I saw a lot of great questions coming through in the chat and then also in the mentee. Um, so to our audience, um, if you want to um, ask a question to our panelists about scholarly identity, now is your opportunity. Um, please either just come off the mic or if you raise a hand, um, uh, either Sasha, Lynn, you or myself will uh, to call on you to come off. Sure, you, Sean, am I saying that right? So question not related to identity, but on the research question. Voice commands while driving. Can you hear me? Now we can. Could you repeat uh, your question? Oh, yes. I am um, I am a second year PhD student in uh, UC Davis. I have a question um, re related to one of the research for Dr. Um, Glallen. Uh, do I pronounce her name correctly? Yeah, uh, it's interesting that um, you study, you conduct a study during the pandemic on the college students' influence from the uh, parental like uh, experience, parental like practice or family environment. Um, and from my experience, like a lot of like UC system is in person classes now, but some of the Cal State system they have fifty percent of the class are online. So I think like that opened the opportunity. Uh, to continue that kind of research. So what's your thought on it? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, um, we're not quite still that much online. So I guess I hadn't thought about that, but that's good to know. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think this research has opened up a lot of doors and it's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, I just had a discussion with someone yesterday and she, we were just both talking about how college students after the pandemic are different. They're, they're just, we were talking about the ways in which they're, they're I think they're less self-regulated. Um, some of my undergrads are saying they weren't really made to do anything in high school due to the pandemic. Um, you know, I have one right now. She's missed the bus. She's left her keys in her apartment. She can never make it to the exam. I mean, it's just this chronic lack of accountability. Um, and I, we, I, I never had a student with all those issues before, but now we seem to have a lot of issues with a lack of self-regulation. Um, so I, I really think in a way the pandemic has opened the door and we're hearing um, it's gonna have an effect on students for at least four years that we're gonna see test scores, all the things. So I, I don't know if this answers your question, but I, I think it's something that we kind of need to keep conducting research even post pandemic, because I think we're all seeing the offshoots of the effects of that pandemic now, whether we are still distance or whatever format, I think we're, we're seeing more normalcy, but we're also seeing some more post effects, if that makes any sense. And listen, thank you so much. Sure. And I would invite all of you to elaborate on that because I'm sure you all have similar or different experiences as well. One of my students is uh, studying sense of belonging at, on our, our college campus, and um, it's taken a hit, right? And uh, we actually had to exclude the years when, when we were doing our research um, to before the pandemic to get a better sense. And our next step might be now um, after the, the pandemic, the pandemic to see um, if we can if we can improve that at all, right? Because sometimes um, the the campus just isn't really as um, busy as it once was. Well, our students are all in their residence hall rooms. They don't come out and, and engage anymore as much. And you walk through the student center now and it's empty, where before it was just booming. And so I do think they're addicted to technology. They're on their computers and their phones more. But I think there's a social effect, yeah. which we, yeah. I think we're absolutely going to see in their academics. So I think there's so... the. I think there's so much research that we can do. Thank you, great question. Does anybody else have a question or a comment that they would like to ask the panel? If you want, you can type it in the chat if you prefer. Um, I'll go if nobody else has any questions. Hello, sure. I'm Jenny. I'm a first year PhD student at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, thank you so much for your um, insights today. Um, but I wanted to ask a question that's kind of apart from the academic focus talk we did today. I was wondering how um, your personal life, um, personal engagement outside of school and academia kind of shaped your scholarly identity because I feel like those kind of go um, hand in hand. Thank you. Oh, and any like very specific episodic memories I feel like um, would be very, well, I'll be, at, at least for me, I'd be very interested to hear any, you know, special um, memories or events that happened in your life. All right. Well, I don't want to talk too much and I'm probably going to date myself, so I'll make it really quick. But, you know, my best friend all through middle school and high school was just a natural genius. She didn't crack a book ever. She didn't bring home any books and she never got below a 98. And so I became really interested in what is it that some people do when I did well, but I studied really hard. And, you know, I think my two kids are like that as well. I have one kid that doesn't crack a book. He's number one in his class. 
my daughter studies really hard. You know, it's just, it's different for everyone. And so I've always been interested in that starting in the eighth grade. And I asked my best friend, how do you do so well? You don't even take any books home. And she's like, I just listen in class. And, and that doesn't work for me, I guess. So I was kind of interested in self-regulated learning, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't have the terminology. And my grad students have heard this story. This is a true story. It was uh, early 1990s. I was in the Penn State Library on a Friday night. I found the special issue on self-regulated learning, 1991. You're all probably familiar with it. And at that time, you had to literally make uh, physical paper copies of journal articles. I took every dime I had in the Ziploc in my backpack, threw it into the little machine, and I copied the entire journal article um, or journal, actually. So grad students today who it's just so easy to do it online, count your blessings on that. And so I literally made photocopies of this entire special issue. And I ran out of that library saying, this is it. Like, this is what I want to study. And that's just how I came across self-regulated learning. None of my professors were doing research in that. And so that started a trajectory that I've now been in for 30 years, literally, in some level. And so I just kind of had that aha moment. Like, I started reading every article in the library, like, in that journal article, or that journal issue. But um I don't know. So that kind of just, I hope you all have that experience where you just find that area that you're so passionate about and that answers your questions. Mine was when I started, was starting to teach and I would have students who failed an exam miserably and they would come to me and they said, I thought that I was going to do really well on that exam. You know, how did this happen? And I just, and that led to my whole, you know, interest in calibration. It's like, how is it that they don't know that they are not prepared at all for this exam and they wouldn't do well. So that was that was kind of a personal experience that sparked um, a whole line of research. For me, I think it kind of harkens back to what Carlton was talking about, like living your values through your academic life as well, where like I would find that like, yes, within an area on motivation, self-regulation, et cetera, like, I can find my my general home, but my more specific contribution to it comes from the things that I'm more passionate about. Uh, and I've always been much more passionate about like really understanding something well as it happens and as it matters to people. And then also figuring out what can I do to actually have a practical effect on it. So that's what's led to really like a focus on, you know, education in the wild through learning analytics and a focus on like, well, what are the interventions that we should be doing and how can we kind of pair those together to like understand the process, use that as the vector to inform the intervention and so on. So a lot of it, I think, does kind of come from the, what do you already, what are you already passionate about? What do you already know how to do well? And how can that help you kind of find your way within a space once you learn about it the way that you'll may have? Great question. Thank you so much. Um, we're running short on time. Uh, before we wrap up, just wanted to take any last thoughts from our panelists that you might have. Just a plug Thank for peer mentoring and community building. Um, you all learn a lot of stuff in episodic ways that you can share with one another and you can build good community and build a sense of belonging. You can do that across institutions and within institutions. Um, so make lab life good for one another and make SIG life good for one another and do your best to kind of build community bottom up because we don't always know what kind of community needs to be built top down. That's a really good point, Matt. And I think that you can, you know, peers can be your mentors too, right? And they can help you shape your identity as, as well as your professors. I would say try not to be super anxious about developing a scholarly identity. I um, think when, when Abe emailed me, I was like, to be on the panel, do I have to know what my scholarly identity is? Like, I feel like I'm still learning it or still shaping it and still figuring out how to articulate it. And, you know, and so I, I was like, I'll do the panel if you think I have a scholarly identity, sure. 
<laughs> That's literally what I said. Um, and so I, I just maybe want to, yeah, calm some nerves if it's out there, because I think it, it will happen over time. And I think the message of, you know, that Jill was saying, like staying true to yourself, like you're, you're going to know what you like and what you don't like. And sometimes it's hard to put words to that, but for a lot of it, like, I just kind of trust my gut instincts. I know that doesn't sound very academic, but part of that has worked. And I feel like the connection between a lot of different interests or directions has been me, you know, I'm the connection. And I think as long as you have that, then I think that that goes a long way. So. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, that wraps up our discussion. Just want to thank um, all of our audience for uh, spending the afternoon with us. And again, uh, a, a huge thank you to our panelists, um, Dr. Linda Bowl, Dr. Um, Shelby Coleman, Dr. Jill Glennon, Dr. Mavernacki, and Dr. Carlton Fonk. Thank you so much for being here. Um, again, we're a part of the Studying and Self-Regulated Learning SSRL SIG. Um, which is made up of a community of scholars who are interested in how learners of all ages and disciplines regulate their learning process. Um, we're going to be hosting these events regularly throughout the year. We'd love to see you again. Uh, and if you're interested in joining the SIG, um, we're going to pop a flyer in the chat with more information on how you can do that. Thank you, Abe. Uh, thank you again for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Thank you very much for inviting inviting me to, to participate. It's been really interesting and um, and I feel honored. Thank you.